I'm Simon Croom, the Executive Director of the Supply Chain Management Institute here at the University of San Diego. And I have with me Professor Nigel Slack from the University of Warwick. Um, Nigel is a Professor of Operations Management and Strategy. Nigel, that's an interesting title, the, the notion of operations management and strategy. Tell me a little about how operations can be strategic. Yeah, that's a good question. A lot of people think operations and strategy are very different things. They're not at all. Operations and operational are different words. Operational is the opposite of strategic. It means day-to-day, -day, it means routine, it means detailed. But operations, that is the resources that create service and create products, well, you can look at that both from a strategic and an operational perspective. In fact, I think it goes further than that because if you believe, as I do, that an important part of strategy is the way we build capabilities over the long term, well, where do you build capabilities? You build them through the experience of running operations-based processes. And where do you store capabilities? You go into an office, there isn't a pile of capabilities just sitting there waiting to be examined and sifted. There isn't a pile of capabilities there waiting to be examined and sifted. Capabilities actually exist within the operations processes. That's where they are. They're, the, they're embedded there for all time. That's an interesting point about capabilities being embedded in operations and there's a lot of interest in capabilities, a lot of literature that talks about capabilities. But what is a capability? How do you start by saying this is a capability and this is just an activity or a resource? What distinguishes a strategic capability from something that's not a capability? Well, if you want a very rough and ready answer, a capability is something that you are particularly good at doing. Furthermore, a strategic capability is something that you're particularly good at doing that other people can't copy or can't imitate in some other way or can't find a substitute for or can't buy off you. In other words, it's difficult for competitors to get hold of that certain something that you've developed over time. That's a capability. Okay, so that, that implies that you're doing something better than anybody else and it's difficult for them to copy you. But if, if it's strategic, where does the advantage come from that capability? How do you say, well, this is giving us an advantage, I don't know, with the customer or with the marketplace? Sometimes you just can't tell. Sometimes you have to build capabilities. In, in the vague hope, almost, that it will prove valuable, depending on what the market's going to be in the future. But that's the same with any kind of investment. Every time you invest in a machine, a facility, any time you make any long-term action, including the idea of building capabilities over the long term, you're still taking a risk of some sort, because you, it, these things take time, you don't know what the circumstances, the environment's going to be like in the future. Now, the great advantage of what we conventionally call capabilities, something that's underlying what we do, is that they can be leveraged in different ways. You buy a machine that can do a certain amount of things. If you don't need to do those things in the future, well, you've partially, at least, wasted the investment in that machine. But if you invest in a capability that is somehow more fundamental than that, like, for example, I don't know, the ability to decode customers' real requirements, the deconstruction of customers' real requirements, that diagnostic capability. Well, that's universal. It can be leveraged in any direction that you want it to be, depending on what happens out there. So capability is something more basic, something more fundamental, at the very heart of, of the activities that you do in order to earn money in the marketplace. So leveraging that capability with, a, with, with the customers, is, is, is that something that operations get involved with in isolation? Or is that something that you need to involve other functions like marketing or supply? And you know, how do you deal with that process of this is what we're good at in our operations and this is what the market needs? Of course, it isn't just about operations. It's about all functions. And the reason why that is is that all functions manage processes. In fact, let's broaden this whole debate away from operations through to process management. Everybody manages processes, um, therefore, in that sense, everybody is an operations manager, at least in my terms. One of the things that here at business schools we sometimes forget is that when we teach things like marketing, 
we're teaching the technical aspects of marketing. We're not teaching people to run marketing processes very often. The same with accounting. We're teaching the technical aspects of finance and accounting. But whether you're marketing or accounting or HR or whatever, you will be running the processes that deliver some kind of usually internal service. And therefore, it's important that you know something about the management of those processes and the basic skills of building competencies and capabilities within those processes. So in that sense, yes, everybody is concerned with building capabilities, and they do it because everybody is concerned with managing processes. So everybody should be involved in training about processes, process design and process improvement, and initiatives that are targeted towards building up that, that capability. I assume process management is a capability. Everybody should be involved in building up that capability because it's not just like the shop floor or the factory or the call center that's going to be involved in uh, developing process capabilities. I think that's right, but I'd kind of phrase it slightly differently. If you put yourself in the position of, say, a, func a functional vice president, vice president marketing, vice president human resources, whatever it is, any, any chief officer or vice president person has three types of knowledge that he or she is usually dealing with. There's the technical knowledge that is part of their function. You know, they have to know about marketing and sales. They have to know about, about finance and accountancy or whatever it is. There's that technical knowledge. That's the equivalent to when I studied engineering before I was a factory manager a long time ago then. The second type of knowledge that they have, that they need, is that broad strategic leadership knowledge because they are the representatives of their part of the organization on the main board of the company. They have to be a trusted partner to the CEO and their colleagues, the rest of the vice presidency, uh, in terms of contributing to those strategic decisions. So they must understand the nature of strategy and the nature of leadership. The third type of knowledge, and this is the one that they're traditionally very bad at, is delivering service internally, managing the processes that create accounting services, marketing services, human resources, resources services, and delivering them effectively and efficiently. Now, in order to do that, you have to understand about processes. You have to understand about bottlenecks, about capacity, about loading, about flexibility, about service quality, all the things that within, a, say, a factory environment, we're very used to dealing with. But I talk to a lot of people like this, and it's surprising how little they know about managing and developing the processes that deliver their services. OK. I mean, that makes a lot of sense that, uh, you know, somebody who's a senior VP for um, HR or senior VP for marketing is, is going to be driving forward the strategy, but now you're saying that they're, they're not really in touch with what's happening in their processes. They don't understand the management of the resources. So there seems to be a disconnect. Or you're there is a disconnect, and I don't want to be considered too harsh. It's that no one's ever pointed out to them that there are some fundamental and basic laws of behavior of processes. Now, anybody who manages, say, a manufacturing process, process knows this. They understand that. They know that there's such a thing as a bottleneck, mm. and that unless they take that bottleneck away or provide extra capacity at that bottleneck, then the whole process is limited by that. You ask the typical HR manager about whether they have information on capacity and loading in their processes to identify those bottlenecks. Many don't have. Or take another example, the idea of variability in processes. Now, you know and I know that the greater the degree of variability, then the less effective and efficient the process will be, which is why standardization is such a powerful thing. But you talk to, say, a typical finance vice president about why they're wanting to standardize throughout their network, their internal network, and they'll come out with some very good reasons, but they very often miss out the key one, which is standardization means less variability, and less variability means far more effective processes. So you can deliver control processes, budgeting processes, whatever they are, to a greater degree of service satisfaction to your clients, and a lot more efficiently as well. So it's a double whammy, that one, because you, you get in efficiency benefits and quality benefits, and the VP's probably focusing on the fact that it's more cost effective. Hey, process managers give you the best of all possible worlds. We all know this, Simon. 
<laughs> Great. Thanks, Nigel. <laughs>